to give a conference, that you use this time also to enjoy having the chance to say hello and to chat a little bit with, with your friends and colleagues. Well, uh, I am Lourdes Vidal Bertrand. I am a professor at Blancarna at the degree of international relations and also at the Master of Advanced International Studies. And I have the great pleasure to be sitting in this room, which is my old uh, first uh, house. So it's always good to come back home. It's like coming back home on weekends. So that's for me also coming back to Yemet. And it's always a pleasure to, to meet again the family. And today also, it's also a very happy day because I have the pleasure to introduce my very uh, good and esteemed uh, colleague, uh, Lura Polozani. I have had the pleasure to cooperate and to work with her these last three years and something on a research project that is led by IEMET on uh, radicalization and violent extremism in the Middle East, North Africa, and in the Western Balkans. And this has allowed us not only to go get out of our strictly Mediterranean comfort zone, but also to learn a lot about a very essential and key uh, region, not only for the continent, but particularly at this stage for the European Union. So, um, Lura uh, is a researcher at the Center of the Southeast European Studies for Southeast European Studies in the University of Graz. Uh, she has been researching in this project CONNECT on radicalization and violent extremism. She, hold, she holds a master from LSE from the London School of Economics and a PhD from the University of Graz. She is currently researching social movements and citizenship in divided societies, particularly in Macedonia, as well as researching radicalization and violent extremism. Uh, she has worked as a, an advisor to the Prime Minister of North Macedonia on cooperation with international organizations. She worked also with UNHCR as an external ex engagement officer. She has also worked as a researcher at the University of Pristina and as a university assistant at C CSEES. She has uh, published a lot. She has also recently and now is producing an incredible amount of research and publications because she's at the moment uh, probably the peak of the knowledge of the, project, the research project and she's producing. So apart from what she has already published, there will be a lot more coming out on cross-regional comparisons, on cross-level comparisons in terms of approaching radicalization and violent extremism. So it's a pleasure. I mean, I'm wishing to listen to, to Lura to learn from you. It's always, uh, it's, it's always a learning experience. So I'm very proud and very happy. And please, Laura, the floor is yours. You are at your home. Thank you. And I really do feel like home. So first, I really am so happy to be here. As Lourdes mentioned, we've worked on this project for up to four years almost. Um, and Lourdes and Mariana have done a great job in managing it like a family, which, you know, sometimes sounds toxic, especially to the youth, but in this <laughs> sense it was done properly with care and uh, basically practicing care throughout the project. So I really am very happy with the project and very proud of what we've achieved, although at the moment I'm very stressed because <laughs> we have a lot of deadlines because the project is ending next week. Uh, but, you know, we're going to do it. We're going to make it. Um, and I'm also very happy to be in Barcelona more broadly, more generally. Uh, I'm also really thankful that you guys are here. When I landed in Barcelona I, an hour ago and saw the weather, I was convinced nobody would be here <laughs> because I was like, everybody's going to have a beer with this weather. Uh, so thank you for coming. Um, and I'm sure the beer will taste better after this lecture. Uh, I will talk today about the very exciting topic of the EU. Uh, I don't know if it's exciting for everybody, but we'll try to make it exciting. Uh, the lecture is broadly called In the EU Waiting Room, Exploring the Western Balkans Road to Integration. Um, but we'll try to kind of incorporate more parts into it, in, uh, including civic activism, uh, domestic policies, but also EU policies to kind of give a larger outlook. Uh, I would like to say that my lecture will be, I'll, I've tried to make it as structured as possible, considering that we're covering a large um, kind of period and also a lot of developments in the meantime. So first, I will be talking about positionality 
and the starting point and the starting assumption so that you can understand where I'm coming from um, and you can understand some of the positions I hold. So then in the discussion section, we can have uh, a more instructive, hopefully <coughs> constructive back and forth. Then I will focus on the background of this whole conundrum of the EU waiting room and why we're calling it that and what the implications are. And then lastly, I will focus on what is at stake when we talk about this waiting room and this overdrawn process. Um, so I hope this kind of set up <laughs> will uh, ensure that we get through all the different parts. But of course, in the end, we'll have a uh, time for discussion, for question, uh, questions from you or you know, comments. So I'd be happy to hear your thoughts. So in terms of uh, pr uh, positionality, uh, first, I like to, as a person coming from the Western Balkans, I very often want to emphasize to audiences who are not from there but are citizens or living in um, countries of, that are part of the EU, how, just how ingrained the EU is in the public imagination of the Western Balkans. So this is something we have to understand from the beginning in order to understand why it matters. Because it was, if it was something marginal, if it was something that, you know, is a process that happens somewhere with only political elites involved, Perhaps it would be a different issue, but it's not. It's much more ingrained in the uh, activism uh, circles, political circles, and societal uh, circles. I was talking with Jordi, Jordi, how do I say Jordi, Jordi. <laughs> uh, earlier about you know going to the bazaar and talking to people, and they'll talk to you about the European Union and what it means, and whether it's being good or bad, um, and whether it's treating us the way it should be. So in that sense, it really is part of the public imagination, and it's also part of a lot of political parties' platforms. Even though we're not member states, we do espouse the language of the European Union very broadly, very openly, and almost integra integrationally in a lot of what we do politically and socially. Then I also need to kind of expose my own trajectory in a way and uh, uh, talk about the fact that although I'm in academia and an academic, I also like to call myself an activist and have been involved with uh, different uh, NGOs. And I've also worked for the government, which has also given me a little bit of a better <coughs> insight as to how institutions react to these changes in EU policy and what it means also institutionally. And also my firm belief that it shouldn't be just the countries of the European Union or the member states of the European Union that get to talk about it. It should be us who are standing at the uh, quote unquote margins or the periphery or whatever you want to call it as well. So I, I hope at the end of this uh, we can come out discussing ways forward that could be you know, a bit more inspirational hopefully. I was reading a book on the plane about optimism because <laughs> I'm trying to get rid of my cynicism so hopefully I'll end on an optimistic note but I do not promise anything. Um, then there's also this firm belief that I have and many other people have who work on this uh, subject of EU's transformative power. So when we're talking about the EU and why it's important in this context there's this normative but also perhaps technical and political view that it does have whole transformative power and as such um, it can use it or decide not to use it as it has in certain cases but it is powerful and it can be powerful. Um, and lastly uh, I would like to kind of connect to the last point I'm going to make and that's where we are now. Um, because more and more I see people being very pessimistic, including myself, hence the book, um, about the whole process. Uh, whereas in 2004, 2005, uh, 2003 at the Thessaloniki summit, which I mentioned in the abstract, everybody was very excited about the Western Balkans joining the EU. Now we call it, and I did like some, I looked at different terms of how the scientists are calling it this day, and we have between a rock and a hard place, paralysis, purgatory, hell, <laughs> and failed. So it's a failed process. Um, so how did we get here? This is kind of the process I'm trying to look at and see um, what, what we get. Uh, but before I start with the background, I am a firm believer that positionality works double-sided <laughs> and it shouldn't be only those in the margins of research sometimes that talk about it, but everybody. So show of hands, um, who believes that the EU should enlarge? EU should enlarge. Oh, where am 
among friends, <laughs> who believes that the EU will enlarge in the next 10 years. This is way more optimistic than I thought, <laughs> but I'm happy about it uh, because uh, sadly, audiences in the Western Balkans are becoming less and less convinced that this is going to be in the next 10 years where we consider ourselves lucky in many ways if we can envision it in the next 20 years, but then I would be too old. Um, so let's start with a little bit of background. Can I? Yes. So first, we have um, the, Thess the famous Thessaloniki summit of 2003, um, the EU-Western Balkan summit. Uh, I love looking at pictures from the olden days, <laughs> although it's not the olden days, uh, because of the resolution of the pictures. It's always so fun. Um, one thing that sticks out, there's one leader who has remained and is in this picture. Can anybody guess who? <laughs> it's not... No, he was not there in 2003. But you know, just kind of a friend of his, let's say. Erdogan. He's over ah, there. Ah, in Yatel. Yes, he's there. He's way younger than he is now. Uh, just shows you what the EU does to you. No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, but at the end of the Thessaloniki summit, there was this big statement or what we call the Thessaloniki promise or what people call the Thessaloniki promise that says the future of the Western Balkans is within the European Union. Yay. But this future has been, you know, a bumpy road. So I've done the, here like a part synopsis of the whole path just to show you kind of some data so that we can put this whole thing in context. I try to be very critical when I talk about the EU from a Western Balkan perspective because sometimes I try to ask myself like, so what? <laughs> or why does this matter? Or why do you call this process blocked? You know, things have been moving, obviously. But if you look at the biggest movement, what do you, does anything stand out? So if we look at all these membership negotiation openings, <laughs> openings what sticks out? The date is after what big event? COVID is one, <laughs> but there's also Ukraine. Ukraine. So with Ukraine, we have a, revital a revitalization of the whole process, whereby some countries that had been waiting forever finally get to start membership negotiations. Um, and that's Albania in 2022 and uh, North Macedonia also in 2022 with some um, caveats. Um, and then also famously uh, this month, Kosovo got its visa liberalization, even though it's been recommended that it get it for, uh, well, as long as I can remember. Um, so when we talk about having stuck in this, nothing describes the stuck in, um, I've left Turkey out for several reasons that I can go to uh, later if you're interested, but for now, the epitome or the, the poster child <laughs> of this delay is North Macedonia, um, in the sense that it applied for EU membership in 2004, it got the candidate uh, status in 2005 very quickly. This also happened post-conflict, by the way, in 2001, North Macedonia had an inter-ethnic conflict, um, and Basically, the EU uh, promise, just like with Ukraine now, was kind of uh, a candy to assuage all the dif difficult choices that political uh, leaders had to make. So it, it came very fast. There was a very quick reform process following it. But in 2000, then in 2006, we had a change of government because of the very tough reform processes that we had to make, whereby we had a stagnation of reforms for quite a while for legitimate reasons. Rule of law wasn't progressing. Um, political uh, uh, corruption and economic corruption in all its forms was abundant. So there was a block, but then things started picking up in, with a new government change in 2017, and perhaps some of you have heard of the Colorful Revolution, 2016, um, and I, I can also talk about that later because I studied it for my PhD, but basically there was a shift. Um, with a new political party, there was a very strong will that, you know, let's get to the EU. And we have North Macedonia, of course the country before Macedonia or the former Rep uh, Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, uh, changed its name, all in the name of the EU. And I'm not just saying this lightly. In the referendum question for the name change, it's do you agree 
on which I voted, <laughs> it's to do you agree to change the name of the country so that it can enter, accede to the EU and NATO. So these things were very practically ingrained into the decision making, uh, making uh, that citizens had to make. Um, and uh, not many citizens voted, but of those who voted, a majority voted yes. Um, and we changed our name. So we thought, finally. Now we, we get moving. Thankfully, we did. We entered NATO, so I don't want to say this was all for nothing, because it wasn't. Um, but when it came to the EU, we hit a very hard wall. And that's the 2019 French veto. So in 2019, uh, there was um, uh, the, the EU member states had to decide whether to open negotiation talks with Albania and North Macedonia, and France said no. Um, and Saying that people were disappointed is an understatement. This marked really a very big shift because it, it was the narrative then of the Western Balkan leaders and political actors that they would say, look at North Macedonia. It changed its freaking name. And you sit, still said no. <laughs> so there was this narrative, especially adopted by the more, let's say, the more not so willing you forces, <laughs> like which is, I think you mentioned earlier, or uh, these governments that are perhaps more reluctant, let's say, to reform, to say, you know, why should we do this? We do everything right, like North Macedonia, make all these costly choices, and in the end, you still say no. So there was, the whole process was basically put into question. But then we see movement in 2002 to the 2022 with the membership negotiations opening. Why did I say that North Macedonia has a caveat? And I'm not just mentioning North Macedonia because I'm from there, but it's one of the cases that is still the most contentious, um, is now that Bulgaria is saying no. So Bulgaria also put a veto on North Macedonia after the French um, because of bilateral issues. Now this was another blow that meant that bilateral issues could potentially block a candidate state, perhaps indefinitely, <coughs> or until they listen to the powers that be. So they really do put some sort of an imbalanced, um, imbalanced power struggle between the members of the EU and then those outside. Now you might say that, but of course there is some sort of an imbalance because here is a union that the Western Balkans wants to join. So it's natural that, you know, since they're wanting to join the group, the group gets to set some rules, right? So you can say logically, you know, we can all agree to the rules of the game. But what if there are no rules of the game anymore? Or what if the rules of the game are not the only thing, the only game in town? And I think with the veto of North Macedonia and also the bilateral issue with Bulgaria, what was evident is that perhaps even though EU has been, had been speaking about meritocracy for so long that countries had to deserve this, finally it's like, is it meritocratic though? So in that sense it opened a lot of questions because if we see here how a country can join, the rules were simple. I mean, simple, but obviously not the easiest always to follow. There's the famous Copenhagen criteria whereby a country has to have rule of law, market economy, and be able to be in alignment with EU regulations and laws. Uh, after the French no, uh, things changed because Macron's uh, basically reason for stopping Albania and North Macedonia was let's put a break on this because we also have to reform and we have to reform the process because the process isn't working. So there was agreement that the process wasn't working, but I think the opinions on what this process should be were very different. So after the French veto and after this proposed changes, there's a new methodology which kind of boosted, but also didn't boost, in my opinion, so much the process, and we have the clustering. So what happens here is that the 33 chapters of the Copenhagen criteria are clustered into groups with the idea that this way, countries, if they're good at their job, if they're good at doing their reform work, then they can actually proceed faster because they get chapters in clusters rather than open one by one. Uh, then there's more of a political push, but because the methodology is so new, I couldn't tell you what the benefits of this political push could be. There could also be detriments to it. 
Uh, and lastly, and this is a very important point, and one of the reasons this was introduced is not only because of the Western Balkans, but also because some of the EU member states, who also sometimes don't play by the rules, um, and that's reversibility. So the EU would have the right, of course, and it's part of the rules of the game, that it can reverse any negotiation, it can reverse any of these decisions. But you say, okay, so there's a process here, right, somehow, <laughs> there is um, uh, movement, especially after Ukraine. There, we can argue that there's been a revamp or movement, although with some countries we see things have been blocked for quite some time, like Serbia and Montenegro that had already opened negotiations in 2012. Uh, by the way, the new methodology applies differently to them, which is also interesting because the rules of the game might not be very similar <laughs> one to the other, which also puts in question is this a process? Can we talk of a process? So what happens in between? So what are the implications of all these vetoes, all these bilateral, uh, bilateral issues that basically uh, make us talk of a waiting room, of the EU waiting room? Or what I mentioned earlier makes many analysts, scholars, activists talk about paralysis, purgatory, and hell. I remember when the um, Ukraine first got candidate status, if you were on Twitter that day, you would see most of the Western Balkan activists and scholars be like, you know, welcome to the waiting room of hell. We're never going to get out. So there was a lot of cynicism. And then I speak to, for example, or hear colleagues from Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia who are now progressing at full speed uh, towards joint membership. And they're so hopeful. Uh, and it reminds us of how hopeful we were. <laughs> um, and at one, on one side of me doesn't want to kill that hope because that hope is so important to pushing for change, especially uh, at these important stages. But it's also uh, a little bit, you know, we, how do I say? Perhaps I think they should see us in the mirror <laughs> in the sense that they, can, they should also see how this process can also go awry and then cause for certain stops and not to get, uh, not to see this in order to lose hope, but rather to prepare and to also push for change before these problems happen. So why do I say that there's a loss of legitimacy here in the in-between? We mentioned the veto of, uh, uh, of Bulgaria and France and the bilateral issue with North Macedonia uh, and Bulgaria. And the reason that this has kind of lost momentum and the legitimacy it's, it used to have is because we're saying, what is the EU? And what does the EU want? And what does the EU want from us? Surely, definitely, we had a lot of high expectations, especially as um, kind of pro-EU uh, forces in the different countries. Uh, perhaps we assigned even more value to it, perhaps more of a normative value to it. but. At the same time, this is a very important normative value to have. Uh, if we take this away, then I wonder whether the process itself can survive and be the f transformative force for good that it can be. <coughs> so that leads us to the question uh, of what is at stake. Uh, I'll come back to this later. Um, but when we talk about what is at stake, is that when it uh, when we refer to the transformative power, I mentioned already that one of the big rewards for North Macedonia in, after the 2001 conflict was EU membership, the promise of the EU membership. Now we have other countries of the Western Balkans that are not in open conflict, but they do have bilateral issues, whether this be Serbia and Kosovo, then there is also internal strife, whether in Serbia or in Montenegro, um, where the EU is a player, whether directly or indirectly, meaning it can push or um, it can help push for reform or not. But then what we learned from the case of North Macedonia is has become sort of a, a cautionary tale because the political, the new political establishment taking over after the Gruevsky regime, uh, they put everything, all their cards were in the EU deck. 
So they said, let's do the painful reforms as to the extent we can. Of course, I'm not saying they did everything right. Um, there are still issues per, uh, persisting, but they changed the name. They made a deal with Greece. Uh, now, with Bulgaria, they already had a deal before the deal with Gre uh, Greece, the Good Friendship Agreement, which again makes this veto even more contentious. Um, and so they put all their cards in the EU deck for it not to pay off, in the sense that now you have a very polarized society in North Macedonia, many of whom don't think the name should have been changed. There's also people who are not very, because of disinformation, which is a different thing, there's also people who think that the deal changed more than it did. For example, there's people who are detractors of the name change who think that now the term is North Macedonian. I'm here to teach you today that it's not, it's still Macedonian or citizen of North Macedonia. But many newspapers and many uh, people generally make this mistake. I guess I've made it too uh, in speech. Um, but there's, uh, there was this polarization that said, okay, we made this big sacrifice, now what? Now give us back our name. And in the meantime, Bulgaria says, you have to change your history books and the way you teach history and you're like, okay, let's discuss this. But then even this discussion becomes uh, contentious because then, first of all, how can history now become a part of this telling of, uh, a part of the process of EU membership? But also it is contentious in the sense that does, does it mean that if an EU member state says it, then it's right? then you have to do what it does, even though in principle it might be wrong. I mean, among historians, there was a big debate about how to deal with the fascist, um, and the history of fascism, and uh, basically how uh, the Bulgarian uh, forces collaborated and all of that. I'm not a historian, so I'm not gonna get in details, but it basically opened the question of legitimacy of these demands generally. Um, and also what can get into these, um, these uh, issues and how countries can use their veto power to basically block the, the whole process. Then there was also harm done in the sense of the public imagination that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, because uh, many <coughs> uh, people, especially many who voted <coughs> for the name change and who keep pushing for EU reform, <coughs> You okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, became very disappointed because this was basically uh, a blow to the face also for them because a lot of NGOs, a lot of activists, they stake their reputation, they stake their own work for these painful reforms. And then when things don't pan out, citizens can also blame them or turn to them and say, you know, you betrayed your country. Um, and you know, even worse things than that, but I'll stick to, to the nice, nicer ones. Um, then there's also the issue of progressive forces. So many of these political parties who are actually pushing for EU reform because they want to internally push for rule of law, for human rights, for democracy, they also feel a bit disempowered in the sense that they no longer feel to have a partner on the other side. Um, if we look at, uh, for example, the social movements in the Western Balkans, many of them will, for example, the colorful revolution, they called on the EU to do something. Although the EU is really not legally a player, North Macedonia was not a member state, it's not a member state. In Serbia, you see the same thing with the protests now. Do something, say something, say something to these leaders just because there is a sense in these countries of a loss of agency. So very often the EU is seen as kind of this more powerful agent of change that can help these progressive forces to push against semi-authoritarian regimes such as the one in Serbia. So in this sense, uh, there's this disheartening effect which I think uh, makes many independent voices feel more alone in the region. Um, but also, uh, and here I come maybe to the larger picture that I would like to discuss with you more broadly, is, you know, with the Macron speech of the veto, if you go back on it <laughs> and listen to it, there are some neo-colonial undertones to the whole speech. There's also been, uh, for example, the, um, the Borel has said, you know, I think there was uh, this very famous statement that he made that the EU was this garden and that, you know, everything else was a jungle and we should protect this garden. And then he made a blog post where he half apologized for it. I don't think it was an apology. He was saying, it's nice that I said this. Why are you, 
well, I, he didn't say it this way. <laughs> I'm really simplifying, but it was more of a justification than an apology. Um, but this is very much part of these negative um, views that keep being portrayed about the Western Balkans. Um, and this is, uh, I think, harming now I've talked about the public imagination of the Western Balkans, but what about the public imagination in the side of the member states of the EU? Because if you keep hearing these countries are so bad uh, and they're so doing so poorly um, and they don't deserve to be in our union, uh, then I wonder how <laughs> this whole spiel can be then changed to say, Let's put these countries in. I mean, Ukraine, for example, has a population of 43 million. It would be one of the largest enlargements. Uh, by the way, the last enlargement was in 2013 was Croatia, so we haven't had an enlargement in the last 11 years. But if Ukraine were to join, it would be 43 million. It would mean large budgetary, um, it, it would have large budgetary implications. It would really have implications in terms of the institutions and who would be a director in which institution, how many directors and all of these things, so it really would have a lot of implications. The Western Balkans, less of implications in the sense that it's 15 to 17 million. I think some of the citizens are already living in the European Union. Uh, so it's, you know, the number is um, up or down. It's not going to get much bigger than this. So in this sense, how will these governments that are saying, you know, the Western Balkans is the, you know, this country, that country is the bad child. Da, da, da. How are they going to convince then their voters in the future that let's get them in? Um, it's not going to be easy uh, because, you know, one would legitimately, legitimately ask, why should we? You've, you've said for years that they're doing so poorly. Now all of a sudden we have to do all of these changes. We have to give up some of our privileges because in the case of Ukraine, I think there's going to be the budgetary implications means that some states get less from the EU budget than they get now. So they would have to be some sacrifices mildly. Um, so in this sense, how would then, how would it work uh, and how would citizens be convinced to follow this process? And this kind of brings me to kind of, let's hope some optimism. Um, and to wrapping all of this up, because in the end of the day, I think I've made a lot of normative claims and have a lot of normative expectations, and I acknowledge this. Um, again, this is, as I said in the beginning, because of the, my belief in EU's transformative power. Um, but in the larger implications, um, EU is oftentimes equated to Europe and the idea of Europe, even though, you know, Europe is much larger than the EU. Uh, but it opens questions, all of these kind of polarizations of, um, of who's in and who's out and what being in means and what being out of the union means, is the question of what is the idea of Europe and who gets to define this idea of Europe. And here I come back to my point that I made in the beginning that I think that countries outside of the union have to have more of a say and more of an agency in this whole process, is that uh, and here I look at the young people in the audience, uh, is in the sense of how we also construct uh, our narratives and how we research both the countries of the Western Balkans but also countries of the EU. Um, I think one of the hopes is to insert the Western Balkans also into the imagination of citizens, uh, citizens of countries from the uh, EU. And I think this is done by one, not taking the Western Balkans always as being this exclusive, you know, a never done before case that is only happens in the Western Balkans. We do this ourselves as well. But taking cases and comparing and creating uh, bridges between countries that are in the European Union and in the Western Balkans, I think with some of the, the project that we're doing now, we're looking into ways of seeing if there are practices and productions that we can, um, that we can learn from each other where, you know, we can say, you know, the EU has things to learn from the Western Balkans, one of the countries that faces a crisis uh, more often than not. Uh, so I think it's gotten good at handling at least some of the crisis. So how can we change these ways of perceiving these countries and then perceiving what they can contribute to this whole idea of Europe? I hope she's okay. <laughs> I hope everything goes well. Um, so in the end, and we can discuss this more broadly as I come to the end of the presentation, is what, 
we think that the idea of Europe should constitute, especially with everything that is changing in geopolitical terms right now. Uh, but also, you know, what are the values we're meant to espouse? What is democracy in today's day and age and how we can divide it? Because one of the things that concerns me, especially in the region, is that we have more and more young people believing that it's good to have a leader with a strong hand. Although that we, uh, data say that, you know, we do appreciate democracy, then the same data, and this is from the Open Society Barometer for Democracy, the same data then says that, you know, uh, democracy is our preferred form of government, but then we also believe, as young people also believe that leaders shouldn't bother with elections. It's like, if you believe that, then how do you reconcile that with the idea that democracy is the main rule in town? And this is not all, uh, by the way, only in Western Balkans, but even more broadly. Um, so as we, ch as, we looking at, as we look at these developments in terms of the, the state of democracy um, in the EU and outside it in Europe more broadly, uh, again, who gets to contribute to this debate and how do we make sure that those in the margins always also get included in? I will end with this comment and look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Well, I can moderate the question. Nothing happens, no worries. Is that because she is a little bit uh, with the room, no? And, and, but nothing, nothing. That we nothing can serious. Solve. So we thank you very much, Laura. We, we can open the debate and the floor is yours. So no problem. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Lura, and thank you for your presentation. Um, really engaging because um, I'll start with the end. The idea of Europe, and um, especially for those that we have studied Europe since the 1990s, long time ago. It's like trying to understand something that is completely evolving or changing. Because evolving is like something positive. Mm. Let's say changing, okay? Mm. And it's true that every time, um, each time we, we try to talk about the enlargement of the European Union, we reach the same question. Which are the limits? Mm. Because the limits are something related to an ontolog ontological element, that what is European Union, okay? Mm -hmm. So we know how it started, we know how it has evolved, okay? And it's true that in the late 1990s, European Union uses enlargement as a conflict prevention tool, okay? They promise something that it seems they had to promise, mm -hmm. okay? They were also pushed by the fact that, well, the, the foreign policy of European Union was quite weak, was not able to put some stability in its surroundings, so the idea is, well, we, we, we need to provide some kind of promise, okay? But it's true that you promise something that you don't believe in, okay? Well, it, it's how I see that, because you show the dates, okay? Uh, we've seen since the Thessaloniki, the idea we have to move, yeah? and if you understand the evolution of European Union, from the center, then the north, then the south, okay, we see that the next stage was the Balkans. Mm. But you, something you haven't mentioned, identity and religion. Uh -huh. Ukraine, 43 million Catholics, Christians, Protestants, whatever, okay. Western Balkans, 15, 17 million people in which we have diverse religious perspectives. In material terms, when, we, when you try to analyze and compare all these these are tiny states, are the small states. So in practical terms, for European Union, regarding budget, regarding voting um, rights, etc., won't be a big deal in practical terms. It's not the same as Ukraine or Turkey. We know Turkey, okay? I always tell my students, I don't know I will be alive when Turkey will join the European Union, okay? Because, well, it's something is there, okay? So as far as, as you have this kind of candidacy, we can try to manage some kind of religion. Uh, religion sorry. So my, my, my main question is, you talk about this kind of disillusion, disillusion in people in the Western Balkans, because these promises are not met. You also talk about, well, to what extent 
European Union is really committed to that. You mm -hmm. asked before, how many people do you think European Union needs to enlarge? How many think it will enlarge? Okay. Well, maybe the enlargement will be provoked by something you mentioned. There is something else beyond the rules of the game. We know there are geopolitics. Okay? We have the Copenhagen criteria. We know them. Okay? <coughs> we can talk about the clusters. We can talk about speeding up the process. But we speed up the process. We also try to, once again, the rules. We try to adapt the rules according to our interest. Okay? So, um, in that sense, uh, I think that we will enlarge to the Western Balkans because the other option is Russia, okay? Also because it will become a sort of buffer zone, Turkey, okay? But the issue is, well, um, we need to do that, we don't want to do it. And also, as I said, because we can also bring some issues like identity. And each time we touch this button in the European Union, we try to divert to another thing, okay? So my, my, my issue is, my question is, do you think that um, people in Western Balkans that are now polarized, as you mentioned, will basically say, well, um, we just give up about the, the situation because we were promised it's taking so long they're playing with us, they're using us as a, an asset. Mm. Do you think that people will basically say, well, if, a, if there is some ch change in Russia, don't know if we'll see change in Russia, maybe we can create a new kind of relation with Russia? Sorry about this line, long kind of uh, explanation, but uh, thank you very much for your intervention. Thank you. Should we group questions or yeah, should I maybe answer one? Or as you feel more comfortable. Well, if there's another question... Is right there any other question for the moment? Gemma? Yeah, yeah because I, I think I, I, huh? I would like to, to go a little bit further with this idea of European identity. Mm. Because um, there is something happening at the terms of, of politics, but there is also something happening in terms of European citizenship and what the, you are saying that it's the identity of what does it mean Europe, no? And mm. I think we didn't interiorize what is Balkans for Europe. We, we already seen this part of, the, of Europe like really far away from our uh, uh, mainstream. So my question is, this is so essential, but it's not enough, uh, uh, meaning there is no political interest in perhaps uh, bringing this bridge uh, in terms of social dimension or communicative dimension. I, we really, you know, the ones working in, the, in this, for example, um, Euro-Mediterranean, we, we see Balkans <coughs> far away from this. Some countries can be Bosnia, perhaps Albania, but there is not the sensation that are take, uh, where, where are they in this, in this thing? It, I think it's really different that the Mediterranean feeling, for example, the enlargement for the Mediterranean countries have been different, and even for Turkey, and here there is the question yeah. also. Because here in this institute, we were working for some, <laughs> a lot of years, about uh, having in mind that Turkey will become European for so many years, we organize every single year EU-Turkey summit and EU-Turkey summit, mm -hmm. but always in this sense different from Western Balkans mm -hmm. reality. After the problems with Turkey will be different. But my, my question is, do you consider that this enlargement can be done with some countries mm. of the Western Balkans and not with everyone, perhaps? Or do you see that this process will, uh, will be a process uh, for all the countries and not for only ones of them? This is the main issue. Mm. And second, um, in this uh, idea of the interest and uh, political interest, which countries do you consider can be much more uh, open to this uh, enlargement through the Western, the, Western the Western Balkans? 
from no from us from, from you from, sorry from the European Union ones for example no do you consider there are some supporters of this idea or in general eh, talking in general or do you consider that the European Union is much more with different issues because we know in the case of Spain is very significant in this regard no mm. Uh, thank you for both your questions because uh, you both uh, are opening things that I didn't open and I should have opened it, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, so one is um, on people giving up but also the opening of identity and religion. Um, I, for my master's I did Idea of Europe identities, ideas and identities, and I was very shocked as a young person back then because, uh, as you said, promise uh, you can't promise something you don't believe in necessarily. And the first time I came to head to head with this idea was when I actually went to study European studies in uh, London. UK was still part of the EU back then. Um, is that, you know, I found challenges that I just didn't understand existed in this shape or form where it was like, yeah, but why should we? Why should we? You know, like, okay, we've opened the process, but why should we ever uh, accept them in? Um, which is uh, definitely something that I, I guess I can't answer. But in the sense of having a process of enlargement that has, um, let's say, more of, uh, that has objectives that are clearly visible from countries wanting to join, I think should be there no matter what. No matter whether there's promises that are made or not, no matter whether there's governments who want these countries to join or not, the process itself should stand as a process in a way that it was believed the, Copenha uh, the Copenhagen criteria would be, right? Um, and we've lost this a little bit, and I think this is one of the main problems. Um, in terms of religion, because I left Turkey out, I also didn't discuss this as much because I think also generally it becomes sadly a problem. I don't think it should be. But when we put Turkey in, I put this picture back because now the EU Western Balkan Summit, I mean, the Thessaloniki Summit had Erdogan, young Erdogan, right? <laughs> so we did have Turkey in that summit, but we don't have Turkey in the, any of the EU Western Balkan Summit. And it, mo many of the kind of publications and papers that are coming out, Turkey is left out, and we have mostly, you know, the, the Balkan six. Um, will people give up? Uh, the thing is, there's a lot of political uh, leaders in the Balkans that do pay lip service to the whole EU integration process, right? They say, we want to be part of the EU, but then they don't do anything to be part of the EU because it wouldn't suit their interests. The danger here is that people will start being okay with that. <laughs> um, and that would be the problem. The, the fact that we become complicit and complacent to the idea of, you know what, we're paying lip service, so what? Whereas until now, I think there's, also, there's always been this resistance that no, you shouldn't pay lip service, you should follow through, not just because of the EU, of course, but also because of the sake of the citizens of all of these countries. Um, but the fact of the matter is that the idea of EU is very influential, even in this case. Um, so in that sense, I don't know if they will give up, the issue of brain drain, the issue of also, you know, people are escaping all sorts of sectors in the Western Balkans from other countries, including the civil society sector. So there's also something to be said about, you know, burnout in the sense that it's hard to fight for ideas uh, when, you know, things keep getting blocked. It's been a very good development now that we have the opening of the negotiations. Um, but still, there's the process itself is very blurry still. And I think as long as this blurriness exists, there's a lot of dangers, whether it be for external actors to come in or for you know, other interests to be um, displayed. And also you mentioned this, you know, our interest. And you know, I, it got me thinking, like, whose interest is our interest? Is it of the single countries? Is it of, the, like, of this kind of supranational, if we can speak of something like that? I don't know. <laughs> um, but. Um, Still, the process itself should be able to withstand at least tempor for some time these uh, blocks and kind of um, shocks to the system. And that leads me to Gemma's question about what does, and, uh, about European identity, citizenship, and what all of this means, because 
Exact, this is exactly the problem. When you make too many shocks to the system, you actually lose perspective and you lose the important things. In North Macedonia, in Serbia, in Kosovo, when we talk about the EU, it's about the, the newest problem that has popped up, whether it be the issue with Bulgaria or you know the, um, the mediation happening in <coughs> Brussels. Um, and we don't get to talk about what entering Europe means. I talk to you know, people and I'm like, so what do you think if, let's say, Macedonia or Kosovo was a member state tomorrow, a member state of the EU, what would this mean? They're like, less waiting lines in the hospitals. <laughs> and I'm like, no, <laughs> I live in Austria. Boy, do I have to wait <laughs> for months to see a doctor. So in that sense, there is this roman overly romanticized of what being part of the union means that in many ways would perhaps even see disappointment among people that, okay, we entered the EU and now nothing is that much better or the way we thought it would be better. But these are discussions we need to have and we can't have them because things keep changing and shifting and they're not clear enough to be able to be communicated clearly. Here also political actors are to blame. The fact that they rely on the EU as an idea so much politically when if not finding any other vision for any of these countries. So, you know, I don't leave our political leaders blameless. I think the lack of a vision that is disattached from the EU, not in the sense of, oh, let's leave the EU be. No, you still stay committed, but also have a vision of your country, of your society that is independent of these shocks. And sadly, in my view, this doesn't exist. Uh, some countries, should some countries enter and not everyone, Whoever fills the criteria, if we have a criteria-based uh, system, should enter, and those that don't, don't. <laughs> but then it's fair game. But again, let's define the process clearly. Um, and I'm also a big believer, as many other, some other kind of activists who've been doing this for longer than I have, who also say, you know, let's give a year to accession again. It used to be, you know, an impetus that by this point we do this and then it kind of gets things moving and we haven't had a year in quite some time. <clears throat> Sorry. As from the side of you champions, you can used to be a champion before they left. <laughs> uh, Germany is a champion in the sense of the Berlin process having started. Um, uh, Spain, from time to time, I mentioned Borel, not in the nice, nicest terms, but from time to time, you're, yeah, you can be a champion. But I don't think anybody has been a real champion in that sense from outside of kind of this Berlin process shape. Of course, Macron also had this political community idea, but it further, in my opinion at least, further hazened the waters because it created this thing of, oh, does this mean, you know, the EU, we're stepping away from it and now we only have this political community, but then, so in a way it's been, there's a lot of testing and that's good. I think that means that there's acknowledgement that things should change. Um, but again, the testing is sometimes not going in the sense of making this uh, process into a full-fledged pr process the way it was perceived to be, um, and in many real terms was, uh, but making it more and more kind of uh, subject to these political shifts and geopolitics and whatnot, and also, I guess, the power struggles within different EU institutions. Uh, so in that sense, I guess, I hope it answered your questions, but, yeah. Any other questions? Any other comments from the audience? Federico? <laughs> so, now that you were talking about that, I was thinking, how the issue with Poland and Hungary in the European Union mm. may affect this enlargement because, was thinking the same. Yeah. because we see, well, we see how we enlarge, mm -hmm. how we need to enlarge mm. for different reasons, mm. okay? How this enlargement in the 2003, 4, etc., with so many Eastern, uh, European Eastern countries, okay, has brought a situation now in which inside this identity, Article 2 of the Treaty of European Union, the values, okay? We see how some of these states are not, are challenging these values. Mm. And maybe this, it's creating some kind of obstacle to say, well, this, you talk about a transformative power. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. European Union for a long time was able to be a transformative power because 
it has also some kind of incentives, economics, single market. We know it's pretty attractive, okay? But the idea, in that sense, is this kind of power, it's being challenged because, for instance, we have, you mentioned, external actors. We have China. One bell, one road. Okay? Well, we know that China, in that sense, it's creating its own kind of network of relations with different states, even with the states in Central Asia, also maybe, I don't know, in the Western Balkans, in order to have some leverage, some capacity, to have economic agreements and some counter, uh, if you want, counter uh, results, okay? So, well, as far as European Union was, as you mentioned before, the only option, the problem, okay? But when we see that this new situation in which, well, we know that Russia now, it's, it's provoking this kind of reaction, okay? So, neutral European countries now deciding <laughs> to join NATO. Those of us have been studying European politics and security, watching all these kind of movements is like, well, yeah, the reaction of Russia. Uh, now we see Russia, it's clear uh, position as a threat. NATO, it's, well, we're taking this kind of discourse. But the issue is that the, we know the change in the, in the government in Poland, but today in the news, we saw how Donald Tusk is having some kind of challenge by the president in Poland. So it's not going to be easy, this kind of reversing all the uh, previous policies. But the issue is that how in Western Balkans you are seeing this situation with two member states, okay, in which bilateral issues can also affect the situation, will be a, a sort of obstacle for the process? So in terms of the, you know, what about the bad cases and them blocking, of course, also Bulgaria, Romania joining and the problems they had in alignment were several times kind of also mentioned in literature. But, you know, now I'm reverting. Thank God I read this book today coming here <laughs> because it's, it's trying to convince me to think of the good cases and trying to say that, you know, we have this selective bias where, you know, we look at the bad case and then we think, oh, look at this country, look how bad it did, this means uh, that, you know, it's not that transformative. But we're mentioning how many countries out of the, all the EU member states? Two, three, four? Let's put Hungary, uh, <laughs> uh, But in that sense, it's been transformative for most of the other, most of the players, a majority of the players, one. Two, because of the bad cases, I do know, I, I'm not gonna say that doesn't have an effect, I think it does have a very real effect. But again, uh, you know, if these countries are not aligning with the criteria that are set, if there is no rule of law and there is no um, alignment with, um, you know, single market criteria and what have you, external relations, all of these, um, then don't get them in. <laughs> I'm not saying that they should join if they, there is no rule of law just for the sake of joining, no. I mean, there's also arguments to be made that the way that Romania and Bulgaria joined, there were, you know, a, a couple of loose ends, as happens, I guess. Uh, but in this sense, you know, again, if they respect the rules of the game. But again, let's make the rules of the game clear. Uh, in terms of the external actors, I, you know, yes, Russia is present in the region. It doesn't, I think the EU is still the, the main game in town. Um, so that is a good thing. And that's why EU needs to capitalize and keep capitalizing on this um, kind of transformative power. Uh, all of the countries of, except for Serbia, all of the countries of the Western Balkans have aligned with, um, for example, all the sanctions against uh, Russia after Russia's whole scale invasion of Ukraine. So in that sense, there has been kind of also this normative, but also this policy and also this posturing that, you know, we stand on this side. Uh, then the treatment of Serbia for not complying has also been an issue in the sense of, ah, so you can also do something that is not in compliance and then you don't get <laughs> anything out of it. You don't get any sort of punitive measures or any kind of um, uh, reaction uh, from it. And I think that has also been 
detrimental to the whole process um, and needs to, again, change in the sense of if we have certain values, if we have certain rules of the game, let's po follow them from both sides. Um, and we don't see that happening so much. So I think that's also part of, um, you know, hazing the waters, so to speak. Um, did I have it? No, I think that was it. Yeah. Okay, any other question coming? Yes, there's one over there. Sure. Um, okay, perfect. Um, kind of a quick question, but more as a stranger to, to EU politics as a whole, but um, is there any risk that the EU would be exposed to a sort of enlargement fatigue? If it extends into the Balkans, does expanding affect the EU's overall efficiency or would you say it would improve it? And um, with so much turbulent cha political change over the years, I'm not sure if you could perhaps answer if the political willpower of, over this promise, the promises of membership has been consistent over the years. Mm. The only example I can think of, for example, the only example I can think of rather recently would be Spanish recognition of Kosovo, for example, which isn't consistent with the rest of the EU. I'm pretty sure that could lead to some conflicts later on, I can imagine. Um, it's not just Spain, it's five countries that don't recognize oh, Kosovo more. inside okay. the EU. That's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was another hand or no? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, thank you for your question. Now, yeah, it works. So I was just wondering, because we recently saw how for the sake of Ukraine gaining, uh, I think it's, is it candidate status or uh, yes. whatever status it got last month? Um, there uh, was last month it was recommended that they start uh, negotiations. Exactly. Which, yeah. uh, thank you. <laughs> so for, for that to happen, there was some pretty shady horse trading in the commission with regards to Hungary mm. um, and its rule of law issues. And I was wondering whether you're afraid that this happening uh, might make uh, actors which would have otherwise been more prone to uh, expansion uh, be wary of um, what this can do to rule of law and the internal coherence of the, the union, you know? So if, because if for the sake of Ukraine getting this fast track to uh, accession, we are allowing for these uh, negotiations and we're overlooking rule of law issues in Hungary uh, for them not to veto it. Um, is that something, you know, that the, not the usual suspects which are against uh, enlargement, which mm. Uh, I, I think ID is polling a third in the EU election, so that's also kind of uh, an interesting development. But for, for the others that would have, mm. the, with that more normative vision of the Union, do you think that is something that uh, can be concerning for the interests of the Western Balkans? Mm. I don't think. Uh, okay, thank you for both your questions, because uh, they're also getting me thinking. Uh, enlargement fatigue has something that we, the EU has been fatigued for the last, what, 12, 13 years? Uh, it's been fatigued for a while. Um, so uh, enlargement fatigue, we can definitely speak of it, and I think uh, very many do, and I think mostly in literature, for instance, you will find this enlargement fatigue, especially after uh, Romania and Bulgaria entered, it was very much spoken of, but then Croatia was given the green light in 2013, so there was a bit of hope that, ooh, things are moving again. Um, but then, you know, again, we started talking about it, and now, again, there's this boost with, um, uh, Ukraine, with the, how the situation changed after um, uh, the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, in the sense of um, is internal issues, yes, EU, EU member states, I think, will have to also have this internal debate about, especially Kosovo, because Kosovo is lacking from many of these processes, and one of the main blocks is also the fact that uh, five member states do not recognize its statehood. So in that sense, I would say, you know, get your ducks in a row. <laughs> um, and I understand the internal issues, but it, considering uh, this 
new geopolitical kind of circumstance that we find ourselves in. And you mentioned earlier that it was used as a conflict management, the EU, but it isn't. But it is. I mean, EU is the largest peace project there was in the European soil, right? Like that is one of its selling uh, points in a way. Um, so in that sense, in order to uh, ensure stability, security, and also this transformative effect, it has to also uh, decide, make some tough decisions itself also in terms of uh, Kosovo recognition, but also then later on in the sense of expanding. Whether it would mean that it would become less or more functional, depending who joins and when, and also, again, how, uh, I guess this is the internal reform that the EU leaders speak of, but also depending on how the EU union changes itself and how it becomes adapt to these shocks. For example, uh, and shocks are doing work in the sense that for Ukraine, some of the um, packages that were used were packages that the EU already got used to using because of COVID, right? Uh, so Ukraine has been involved in more benefits uh, from the EU as if it already was a member state in many respects. One case in point is, you know, Ukrainian refugees being able to work and also having uh, social security security in <coughs> member states. This is not something you get <coughs> otherwise, right? Uh, so there, it has shown flexibility and it hasn't broken the union as far as I'm aware. So in that sense, um, I think, and this connects then to your question about how Ukraine affects this, how kind of closing one eye. I think with the players who are pro-EU, I don't think it has disheartened them this debate, but rather it has opened this box of, huh, so maybe we could intervene for changes to happen and changes could be possible with the right kind of setting um, imposed. And I think uh, one encouraging thing that I see, especially coming out of the Western Balkans, is that you know one we've been part of the process for so long that there's people who have a lot of knowledge of it, um, intimate knowledge, in the sense that you know they already know it perhaps more than some experts inside the union itself, right? Um, so in that sense, that gives me hope because they've been much more involved in these debates. They've been more vocal and more critical before they didn't used to be so much, right? Because it used to be like, there's this criteria, oh, but you're not respecting the X and Y. But after you you know, decide not to open negotiations because of the name or because of uh, bilateral issues, then it became, aha, so you're changing the rules of the game and now you're opening up the space to actually critique these practices. So in that sense, it has open space. On the other hand, I do worry because sometimes I see these uh, events as being kind of a open therapy session like <laughs> where we're criticizing and complaining and then nothing happens or nothing changes. So that also happens. Uh, but I think generally, I don't, I don't think it has dissuaded people, but rather it has made many activists, uh, many uh, scholars who come from the Western Balkans to be a bit more vocal and a bit more, you know, kind of reclaim agency, I think, because also they know these contexts. They know how a turn to semi-authoritarianism looks like in real terms. So in that sense, it has kind of um, centralized their marginal, their marginality in the sense that, oh, but the EU is doing the same thing, or a member state of the EU um, is doing the same thing. So how can we shape this conversation moving forward? So yeah, in a weird way, I, I find it empowering, if that makes sense, <laughs> from a counterintuitive perspective. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Okay, I don't know if there is any other question left. I think that uh, I, I think that we have very interesting things on the table. I, I, I have been tempted to think to what extent, I mean, trying to see it from the other side, not to mm. what extent the EU can keep uh, not only leverage but also credibility mm. uh, if this does not finally end up in something. Mm. Okay, so in that sense, I think that there's a lot of, uh, at stake for Western Balkan countries, but also for the European Union and for the project itself. Mm. Uh, so we will have to, to be aware, to look uh, for news, to be attentive to the process, uh, the so-called process, and see what's going on. It has been a pleasure, Lura. Thank you for your energy, your generosity, and hopefully we will have you again. Thank you. So hopefully we will have you again here, I hope, very soon. Thank you very much to Thank all you. and see you on the next conference of Aula Mediterranea.